Dealing with uncertainty is tricky, both from a statistical, a sense-making, and a data visualization perspective. My goal with this lecture is to give you an intuition for how to reason about uncertainty, and I would highly encourage you to check out the readings that accompany this module for a larger list of techniques and considerations for choosing effective uncertainty representations. To start at the beginning, when we are dealing with uncertainty, we're often trying to summarize or aggregate a set of points like this, where we have a set of measures that all pertain to some core idea. And one way we might summarize those measures is by, for example, computing the mean of all those measures. Well, this mean only captures so much of the information that's captured by the points in the scatter plot. So one thing we can do to give a little bit more intuition to the reader about how well does this mean actually reflect the range of points that we see in our scatter plot? Is we can just add an error bar. So these error bars can specify any sort of dimension of uncertainty, but their basic goal is to give us an intuition for how precise or how well reflected our data is by this mean measure. And uncertainty arises in any number of situations, in part because data are inherently a sample of the real world. It's very, very difficult, and there are very few situations in which we can truly, truly collect a fully representative set of data. Instead, we're often trying to reason over a partial sample, and uncertainty lets us achieve that. For example, we can use uncertainty to reason over pro problems or variants in how the data was collected between samples. This becomes really interesting once you start looking at data across organizations or even across countries. For example, epidemiological practices differ significantly across countries. So looking at things like disease progression can beget quite a bit of measurement uncertainty just by looking at how the different disease data collection practices are performed and how they're quantified. We also can see effects of transformations performed on the data. So that is very similar to the example we just walked through. Things like if I choose to average the data or I choose to compute a linear aggression, what does that actually tell me about the true underlying data? Those models are also inherently an approximation of the data. So how good is that approximation? And finally, we can use uncertainty to reason about the data's suitability for an intended application. Does this data actually make sense for the kinds of questions we need to answer with it? This is especially the case when we're dealing with vague definitions or concepts or unknown or ambiguous meaning when we're trying to collect data. So uncertainty can arise through all of these different practices. And we typically think of three different common sources of uncertainty. We have measurement uncertainty. This occurs when we're collecting our data. You can think of this as we aren't sure what exactly the data are. We have our model uncertainty, which occurs when we try to use computational techniques to make sense and process data. So we're not necessarily precisely sure how the data fit together. And we also have decision uncertainty, and this is when the uncertainty lies with people. We have the data, now what do we do with it? Typically speaking, most techniques for visualization are focused on model uncertainty because it is much easier to quantify the uncertainty involved in any particular data model. However, you will also see situations where measurement uncertainty or decision uncertainty arise. For example, we might have measurement uncertainty if we're thinking about the margin of error associated with a typical sensor reading. So part of why we care about uncertainty is uncertainty allows for more sophisticated decision making through data. We can use uncertainty essentially to provide a proxy for the likelihood that differences between two data sets actually mean something. For example, if I have the bar chart you see here and on the left I have the average of measures from a placebo group, on the right I have the average of measures from a treatment group, I could ask you, does the placebo have a lower measure than the treatment? And some might say yes, just looking at the data. Others might say we don't really have enough information. How accurate and how much variance is there in the placebo measures versus the treatment measures? Well, one thing we can do is we can put error bars on to provide some measure of the range of expected uncertainty. For example, if my error bars looked like this, I could probably say with a fair bit of confidence that the treatment has higher values than the placebo. Placebo, pardon. But if I have error bars that look more like this, I might not come to the same conclusion. 
One trick that you might find with error bars is that error bars can represent any number of different uncertainty measures. Most commonly in statistical applications, they'll represent either the standard error or what is called a confidence interval, but they can also represent a range, a min or max value, interquartile ranges, standard deviation, choose your favorite uncertainty statistic, and you can usually represent it with an error bar. So one key thing if you're using error bars in any sort of public communication or presentation is to label what those error bars mean because certain error bar ranges are going to be more or less meaningful depending on what the statistic is. There's one other challenge when we deal with error bars, and that is if you think about the fact that an error bar in and of itself is composed of two pieces. We have our bar chart and we have our error bar. And one quick caveat I should add is you can add error bars to other kinds of representations like dot plots, scatter plot points, uh, but most commonly in scientific communication we see bar charts tossed on error bars. And so one of the tricks that emerges when we're putting bar charts on these error bars is that people tend to think that values that occur within the confounds of the bar actually are more likely. This is what's called the within the bar bias. So for example, let's say I have these two measurements. So I have my red measurement here and my second red measurement here on the right. And then I have my primary distribution represented by my bar chart bar here. Which of these measurements, which of these red dots on the left or on the right would you say is more likely given my sample measures shown by the gray? Hopefully most of you would say the measure on the right is more likely. This is closer to the mean of the distribution itself, whereas this point for the same mean is much further away. Now I'm going to show you another example. Same question here. I have my two measures, my two red dots, and I have my two sample sets, my two gray bars. Which measure here would you say is more likely? The vast majority of people would actually say that this sample point on the right is more likely. But one thing you might notice if you're paying careful attention is that the distance between the top, the, the red sample point over here and the top of this bar and the red sample point over here and the top of this bar are actually the same. These two outcomes are equally likely, but people tend to think that outcomes that occur within the shape of the bar are more likely. And so this phenomenon known as within the bar bias can be a little dangerous when we're dealing with uncertain data. This is why as an alternative to bar charts and error bars, um, we have a lot of different approaches that give us more information about the distribution of values while also avoiding this within the bar bias. For example, on the, on the middle here, we have gradient plots. So gradient plots have their transparency fading out from the center as a function of the distribution of the data. So we can see that values that are further away from the mean are less likely. We can also use something like a violin plot, which we see over here on the right, where we have our means represented by these bars, but the width of our shape or of our mark at any point reflects the distribution of sample values within that particular bar. And so like we have in gradient plots, we're getting more information about what is the actual distribution of values. For example, here we can see that the mean might be a pretty good reflection of approach A, but approach C is highly skewed towards lower run times. So these just offer two kinds of um, alternative uncertainty representations that have been shown to be more reliable than your traditional bar chart plus error bars. But it's also possible to layer uncertainty on top of existing visualizations. And typically speaking, the way that we approach this is that we design our visualization and then we layer on an additional channel that will enable us to communicate the uncertainty associated with different points. For example, we'll often see this in line graphs where we get what are called confidence bands, those shaded regions right around the lines. But we can also do things like make data points that are uncertain more fuzzy, make them smaller, make them lighter, make them foggier, 
and also even make them sketchier. It turns out if things look sketchy and hand-drawn, people interpret that as being more uncertain. So this is just a sample of techniques that could be layered onto an existing visualization to try to communicate uncertainty in your data. And with that being said, what I'd encourage you to do is go ahead and try it out. There are many, many different ways of representing uncertain data, so grab a pencil and paper and sketch out as many ways as you can think of to visualize the following uncertain data, which consists of just two measures. Measure A, which is 4.2 plus or minus 0.8, and measure B, which is 6.0 plus or minus 1.